All right. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And on Standing for Truth, we focus on the truth of biblical creation. We also host interviews, debates, discussions, lectures, and more. If you enjoy the content coming out of this ministry, then please hit that subscribe button and make sure to share around our material as the truth is incredibly important. Now, it is a privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Grady McMurtry here with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Grady, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time for tonight's very important show. Well, I'm very glad to be back with you. It's been a while. <laughs> yes, it has. Yes, it has. I've uh, told the audience I've got your uh, previous interview that we've done with you in the description box. You were one of the first interviews we've done uh, roughly three years ago. So time really does fly. And uh, that was an interview that got a lot of great feedback to this day, Dr. Grady. So again, thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. This is going to be awesome. So before I uh, kind of hand it over to you just to get to know you a, a little bit more, I do want to uh, give a brief introduction. We've had a lot of new subscribers, a lot of new supporters. So for anybody not familiar with Dr. Grady, I want to give a brief introduction, which you can also find on the creationworldview.org website. That's uh, Dr. McMurtry's website. Lots of great material there. Lots of great uh, articles. So definitely check that out. Should be listed in the description box. So that being said, Dr. Grady S. McMurtry is an American Christian apologist who focuses on the areas of biblical creation and creation science. Dr. McMurtry er earned his BS from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, an MS from the State University of New York, Syracuse, and a doctorate of divinity from the School of Theology, Columbus, Georgia. He is a regent and adjunct professor of the School of Theology, Columbus, Georgia, life member of the Creation Research Society, and a member of the Mensa Society. McMurtry was an evolutionist for 20 years, a theistic evolutionist for one and a half years, and has been a biblical creationist for 35 years. He has made hundreds of appearances on radio and television, lectured in universities, colleges, and schools, and spoken in churches worldwide. In addition, Dr. McMurtry is on the recommended speaker lists of national educational and ministerial organizations. Lastly, he is the author of many articles, magazine, and newspaper articles in the United States and abroad. Uh, Dr. Grady, thanks again for being here. Uh, a little bit more about yourself, if you wanted to elaborate on anything there as well. Go ahead. Well, I, I would think in terms of introduction, um, yes, I have all those credentials. Thank you very much. I'm also a member, life member of Intertel. But, uh, you know, as I point out, at least down here in Florida, where I live, all of that plus 79 cents will buy a refill at Circle K. So, you know, um, I think it's more important to point out that I was an evolutionist. I, I grew up as an evolutionist. I believed in evolution. I would go on to teach evolution through seventh grade to university level. But at, during all that time, I was never taught that there was a perfectly valid scientific alternative to the various theories of evolution, because there's no such thing as the theory of evolution. And uh, at the age of 27, I simply said to myself, you know, Enough's enough. I'd been around Christians all my life. Some had tried to witness to me very ineffectively. Um, but either either Jesus was telling the truth or he wasn't. It's a very simple thing. Uh, not too dissimilar from, say, C.S. Lewis or uh, other apologists who, who simply tried to determine for themselves whether Jesus was telling the truth. And so I took my academic skills, my analytical skills, applied that to the question, and six months later became a Christian, but that only made me a saved evolutionist. And so I spent 16 more months looking at the science, all fresh, a blank piece of paper, and came to the realization there was no science to support evolution whatsoever. It's a fairy tale for adults. It's a house of cards. Um, and after that 16 month period, I became a biblical scientific creationist, someone who believes 100% from the Bible and 100% from science that creation is true, occurred in six days as we experience them today, and 
that uh, the Earth and the universe are only about 6,000 years old, not only for biblical reasons, but also for scientific reasons. At that point, I started teaching on it. And uh, to update your bio a bit, which is certainly an older one, I've been teaching on it now for close to 45 years. Uh, of course, COVID has prevented me from doing our, our foreign work in the last year and a half, but I speak bit, you know, domestically as well as in foreign countries around the world, primarily in those nations which have the governments that are socialistic or communistic. And for example, I have taught in Canada, though it's been a while back. Awesome. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, Dr. Grady. As I was telling you earlier, uh, I love listening to you speak. Uh, where I live, I get to listen to Bob Duco, and I've heard you on there several times, including my my family. So you are a wealth of information, which is why I'm pumped to have you tonight. We've got a great audience already, and I'm sure a couple hours is going to fly by, given all the questions we've already got. Uh, I'd like to start off, though, Dr. Grady, with this question. Um, why are you a young earth creationist and, and why is it important? <clears throat> well, it is very important. Of course, the why I am is yes, as a Christian, I believe in biblical inerrancy. The Bible clearly teaches that the earth and the universe are 6,000 years old, give or take a few years, you know? Um, but when I was an evolutionist, I believed in millions and billions of years. I bought into the, the lies of people who were teaching me uh, various arguments for supposedly millions and billions of years. When I was studying those 16 months after becoming a Christian and becoming a biblical scientific creationist, I came to realize that there are what are called geochronometers, uh, meaning earth time clock or universe time clock. And today we have over 350 of them. I mean, when I started, there was only 250. Now there's over 350. Um, on our website at creationworldview.org, you mentioned, we have a whole series of videos that are for free. People can watch them to their heart's content called Did You Know? Now today we have 285 of these. Uh, they're only one minute, three minutes, five minutes long. But 180 of them deal with short arguments for a young Earth, young universe. That's how much material we have. And as you mentioned, we have articles, books, DVDs. We are even going to USBs now, electronic downloads. You know, it's the whole package. Um, but the geochronometers are, in my opinion, the single most important thing scientifically when it comes to the acceptance of creation or evolution. Because if the universe was old, it wouldn't make evolution true. But if it's young, it means evolution is impossible. And so when you have 350 scientific proofs that it's young, that destroys the evolutionary side of it because they don't have one single proof that it is old. They have five major arguments that they use to try to deceive people into believing it's old but they do not have one single proof and we have over 350. Now, just based on weight of evidence alone, that should tell you something. But let's go on to the why is it really important? And so for those listening, I would say this, remember that the age of the earth issue is not the salvation issue. Uh, you can believe in an old earth, old universe, still go to heaven. It's not the salvation issue. But the age of the earth and universe are critical to the gospel. Because if the earth and the universe are old, what is the only reason that you would have to believe it? It would be that you believe that plants, animals, people have been living, dying over millions and millions of years. Now, if that is true, then death comes before sin. And the God of the Bible, well, he's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's a liar. He cannot save a remnant. Uh, he does not always have a witness, and death would come before sin. Now, the Bible is very clear about this, that it was only through the sin of the first man, Adam, that death of a nefesh organism, that's a very important word, nefesh organism, which is Hebrew. Um, but the death of a nefesh organism occurred only after human sin. That's Romans chapter 5. Also, 1 Corinthians 15, there's various verses. And so 
if you do believe in an old earth, old universe, and you claim to be a Christian, without realizing it, I'm not saying it's intentional, I'm, I'm not trying to be despairing of you in any way whatsoever, but what you are doing is ultimately destroying the power of the cross you claim to have in your life, because if death did occur before human sin, then death is common, there's nothing special about it, human sin didn't cause it, it's not the causative agent, and therefore the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is meaningless, it's just another death. It is only when we realize that God created perfect, whole, complete about 6,000 years ago, placed two people there, Adam and Eve, gave them the right to mess things up, which they did, and then and only then did death come into the universe. That's critical, because if you don't believe that, then you're negating the power of the cross. It is only because we do believe that Adam and Eve's sin caused death to come into the universe that the death of one sinless life, Jesus Christ, on the cross can atone for the sins of the world as the second Adam, the one who does away with death. Amen. Great response, uh, Dr. Green. I really appreciate that. So I guess branching off of that answer and so many good points there. Uh, it, it has been claimed, Dr. Grady, that actually even claimed by many well-known Christian apologists such as uh, William Lane Craig, who has even stated this recently. So they'll say that when you do a sensitive genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11, it suggests we are not dealing with a straightforward historical narrative, but they'll say we're dealing with a mytho history. What is the best way to respond to this kind of claim or argument? Well, first of all, when it comes to William Lane Craig, I would say that he has done some very good work in the area of apologetics for Christianity. However, he is at best atheistic evolutionist, and um, I don't want to disparage him too much, but I would say that his concepts of original sin, his concepts of the inerrancy of scripture, particularly dealing with Genesis, are aberrant. Now, I, I get a lot of flack for that, but the fact of the matter is it's very easy to prove by simply going to his website and reading what he believes. Uh, his concepts of original sin are, are aberrant, they're heretical. Uh, same thing with his belief in an old earth, old universe. He in fact says, uh, and I have read this myself, that he believes that those of us who are young earth believers, and particularly biblical scientific creationists, uh, have a hole in our head big enough to drive a semi through. So that's what he thinks of us. But I'm simply pointing out that his views, often very good arguments for Christianity apologetically, are still based on the false premise of an old earth, of old universe, and a false premise of original sin. Thank you. Uh Dr. McMurtry, I've heard him say recently, and this one just came to mind, so it's not really a specific question that anybody has asked so far, but I heard him recently say in, in a discussion, and he's not the only one, so we can just kind of um, generally address this, but they'll say, because we'll point out that Jesus Christ himself, our Lord and Savior, said that he made the male and female at the beginning of, of creation, right? And uh, they claim that this could not have been the very beginning because even according to us who hold to the creation week adam and eve were created on day six so that can't be the absolute beginning and therefore we shouldn't take it so literal um what are your thoughts on on an argument like that from these theistic evolutionists well first of all i, I need to make a real distinction here we never read the bible literally we read it as inerrant because which language would it be literal in? Only in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And even then, remember that God is a perfect author. You cannot read the Bible, even in the original languages, as literal, simply because God, being a perfect author, uses simile, metaphor, analogy, parable, proverb. And we as humans, when we write literature, cannot do those things unless he did them first. Now, the fact of the matter is, when we take a look at the early chapters of Genesis, they are written in what is referred to as Hebrew continuous narrative, meaning it's history. Now, every language has sub-languages within it. 
So for example, in English, we would write poetry different than a business report. You know, we write history different than fiction. So the argument that these people like William Lane Craig have and, and talking about, oh, it's metaphorical, it's uh, allegorical, um, you know, it really makes it mythological, um, is simply an error because the language itself tells us that God wrote it as a historical narrative when it comes to the description of creation and what happened early on. Much of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew poetry, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is in fact in it. It simply means that that's the form of language that was chosen to describe this, that, the other thing. And so there's a big problem with people who want to take something literally, and in fact, it shouldn't be. It should be taken as inerrant, and we need to understand which method of language it was written in. Amen. Well said, uh, Dr. Grady. Such an important point. I'm glad that you pointed that out because a lot of times the theistic evolutionists or the old earth creationists, they'll accuse us of believing in some kind of wooden literalism. Because I've heard them say that because of passages in Genesis, such as Genesis 2.24, which says that a man shall leave his wife and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh, they are saying because of these metaphors found even in Genesis, then therefore we shouldn't take Genesis as, as literal history. But Genesis 2.24 is not metaphorical. It's prophetic. Hmm. You see, again, it says that because of the things that are recorded in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, because God gave us the pattern for marriage, one man, one woman united for a lifetime, because of that in the future, after they have children, that this is what's going to happen. And so there it is not metaphorical, it's prophetic. That's a great point, Dr. Grady. Um, here's a good question that came in from the chat that's uh, kind of related to this portion here. And it's from Jerome. Jerome, I appreciate the question, brother. He says, uh, SFT, question for doctor. What was the strongest pull for you toward YEC and away from Old Earth? Well, first and foremost, the Bible must be our first authority. Clearly, the genealogies of the Bible particularly that of Mary, proved that the Earth and the universe are only about 6,000 years old. Now, that was a lot easier to say in the year 2000 than it is today. So what am I going to do? Say 6,021? But, but either the you know, Bible is telling the truth or it's not. You cannot use your wisdom to decide whether something is true or not because God wrote it. As a matter of fact, that's a statement that paraphrases Martin Luther. Now, in addition to that, then, good science proves that the Earth and the universe are only about 6,000 years old. And it doesn't matter where you look. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the heat loss of the Earth or the heat loss of the moon or the recession rate of the moon or lumpy rings around planets or barred spiral galaxies. Uh, rotation of the sun. I mean, again, remember, there's over 350 arguments, and I'm not going to sit here and list all of them tonight. <laughs> I'm not trying to bore anybody. To me, the single greatest argument for a young Earth, however, is the decay of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, carbon-14 is certainly in the top 10 reasons to know that the Earth is young. Um, there are other very solid arguments. Uh, but, for example, there's 10 scientific arguments just to prove that the moon's young. So, uh, again, we, we can look everywhere in nature and see that it's all young. Do not be deceived by the evolution saying, well, it just looks old, doesn't it? Well, with makeup, I could make you look pretty old, too. <laughs> but that doesn't make you old. I have sat on the uh, west edge of the Jordan River Valley in the Negev and looked across at the other side of the valley down uh, towards Elad. And you can clearly see the erosion alluvial product at the base of the ridge on the opposite side, on the east side, the Jordan side. And when you look at it, you suddenly realize there's only enough material that has eroded there for at most a few thousand years. There's not enough material for it to have eroded from millions. If there were, the ridge wouldn't be there. 
That's a great response. And so, like, like you said, we, we would have to be here all day, probably for the next week, <laughs> going over all the overwhelming lines of evidence suggesting a young Earth and overturning an old Earth. Um, the magnetic field, the decay of the magnetic field, I completely agree with you. That is a, a, a fantastic evidence, line of evidence supporting a, a young Earth. I've heard uh, some evolutionists and uniformitarians try and uh, rescue the old Earth by saying, well, maybe the uh, Earth's magnetic field has have gone through reversals and maybe it's not, uh, you know, exponential decay, you know, these types of rescue devices. What are your thoughts about those, Dr. Gravy? They're living in a fool's paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think about this for just a second. Uh, first, I'll start off with a great truth, and then we'll attack the question directly, okay? First of all, I don't care what you find in science that disproves evolution, particularly things that are linear, say. They will say, oh, no, it's curvilinear. And then when you find something that refutes evolution that's curvilinear, they'll say, oh, no, it's straight line. Uh, that is a great truth. It comes from Dr. Grady's 101 Great Scientific Truths. Now, when we apply that to the decay of the magnetic field, even evolutionists will agree because they have to. It's fact. We can measure the decay of the Earth's magnetic field as it is occurring today. Everybody agrees it's going down in strength. Everybody agrees it was stronger in the past. It'll be weaker in the future. That's fact, and they deal with it. However, they realize that if it decays to zero, it proves them wrong. So what do they do? They invent a fairy tale for adults. And they say, well, yes, it goes to zero, but it's curvilinear. And so what happens is when it does go to zero, then the poles reverse, north-south reverse. Uh, the field is regenerated and then starts to decay again. Now, that's a fairy tale. Because let's look at the science of that. Now, everybody in the audience is pretty much aware of MRIs or MRTs, depending upon what country you're in. Um, and magnetic resonance imaging works on people. We stick you inside a big electromagnet. We can visualize what you look like on the inside with the use of a computer and software program. And it's really great stuff. I mean, I've had about six or seven myself. It's a whole lot better than cutting you open. But think about it. It works on the basis of magnetism. Now, if you take the current decay of the Earth's magnetic field, remember it decays the same way a radioactive material decays. It's not straight line. So it decays with a half-life. Now, we know the half-life because we've measured it long enough. Remember that we've measured the Earth's magnetic field now for almost 200 years. And uh, we know it has a half-life of 1,400 years. So if you go back in time, every 1,400 years, it's going to double. In the future, it's going to half. Now, if you go back eight to 10,000 years, the strength of the Earth's magnetic field uh, would be lethal. It would simply kill you. Every single cell in your body would be ripped to shreds. So that means, number one, humans cannot have been on the Earth even eight to 10,000 years, so we didn't evolve from apes a million years ago. And let's think about this thing about reversal. Now, if the magnetic field goes to zero, we're all going to die because the magnetic field of the Earth causes what's called the Van Allen radiation belts, but it is protecting us from the deadly radiation, primarily solar winds and some galactic um, radiation as well. But if we don't have it, we'll all be irradiated and die. So if you go forward a while, we're going to die. You go back more than eight to 10,000 years, we'd be dead. We live in a very short window of time. Next question, second law of thermodynamics. If it went to zero, please tell me by what natural mechanism the field could be regenerated. That's where it's a fairy tale. There is nothing in nature that would rebuild the field. You know, that's asking again to get something from nothing. And so when we take a look at the particulars, the story might sound convincing to those that are not educated or not aware of the science. But to somebody who does know the science, it's an absolutely vacuous argument. Well, that's a great detailed answer, uh, Dr. Grady. And I love the way um, 
you explained it there. And from my understanding, and, and as you uh, pointed out there, is if we were to run Earth's magnetic field back even just 60,000 years ago, it would have then been stronger than a neutron star, which is more than enough to literally rip the atoms of our body apart. So well, if, you go, if, you go back, if you go back 10,000 years, theoretically, you would have what we would call a magnetic star. But of course, life doesn't exist on stars. You don't have to go back 60,000, 10,000, you're, you're dead. And so, again, these ages they talk about cannot possibly happen. And let's take it a little further then. Okay, so if you go back even eight to 10,000 years, we'll all be dead. And again, if you go forward, uh, say, another 14 to 2,800 years, we're all going to be dead. But let's just buy for a second that somehow or another we could survive. And that some mythological way in which we can regenerate the field. Think about the consequences of that. Because what that would mean is that life would have to evolve all of that life that they talk about evolving in only the last few thousand years. And it would be dead 10,000 years from now. So that means every time the Earth's magnetic field cycled, then we'd have to start all over again. And even they don't believe that. <laughs> right, great point. When you remove time from the equation, because they oftentimes, Dr. Grady, look to time as the hero of the plot for the story. But they don't have time. George Gold actually used that terminology back in 1955. <laughs> right. A staunch evolution has said time is the hero of the plot. Given enough time, that which is you know possible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you're actually paraphrasing what an evolutionist said, but he also was a guy that would have believed in the hopeful monster theory too. Right. Exactly. Great point. Uh, so many good points there that I could, uh, you know, expand on, but I'll, I think I'll save some of those for later because we do have a lot of questions flying in. And I think this, this question I'd like to get in here. This is one of the first questions that came in from super redeemed energy. Um, he asks, Best argument against the gap theory. As a matter of fact, we have a DVD on our our website. And again, these are available through electronic download, etc. Not just a DVD. But there are six major theological arguments. We're not talking about the science of geoeconomics. There are six major theological reasons why the gap theory cannot possibly be true. Now, I would like to just historically go through that for those that are listening and might not understand the gap theory, but the gap theory originated in 1813 when a theologian named Thomas Chalmers invented it. Um, and he invented it for the sole purposes of trying to put evolutionary time into the scripture. Now he theoretically believed the Bible, but he also believed that evolutionists were telling the truth. So in 1813, uh, he said, well, obviously from Genesis one, two on the Bible's chronological. So he said that there must have been a gap of millions and billions of years between verse 1 and verse 2 in Genesis chapter 1. And that this is the time when dinosaurs lived and he changed the floodwaters of creation in verse 2 to what he called Lucifer's flood, uh, negating Noah's flood as a worldwide flood, making it a local flood. Uh, there's a lot of things in it, but I just want to kind of briefly point this out. Now, the six major things that are theologically wrong with the gap theory are, it means that God is not omniscient and he is not omnipotent, that he cannot do it all at one time, and that he's not smart enough to do it all at one time, that he had to do it slowly and gradually. As a matter of fact, the gap theory says that things got so bad, he had to obliterate it and start over. Now, that is certainly not an omniscient God. That's not a, a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful. Four more things. It makes God a liar because in the Bible, he says, I created 6,000 years ago. Adam and Eve were there at the beginning, literally meaning on the sixth day they were created. And it also says that God has not always had a witness that for millions and billions of years, God did not have a witness that plants, animals were dying, um, whatever. And there are different gap theories, um, whether there were people or people with no souls, which is ridiculous, it's not possible, uh, or no people at all. But nonetheless, there were creatures living and dying. Uh, but the things got so out of hand 
that God had to obliterate it and start over with Adam and Eve. Now, if that's true, again, if it can get out of control, God is not omnipotent. Uh, he is not El Shaddai. And they say that, well, millions and billions of years without a witness. But if you go to Romans chapter 1, Paul says, since the creation, his invisible eternal powers have been seen through the things that he has made so that they are without excuse. Now, there are many other scriptures. I'm just trying to point out a few. Right. Uh, but the Bible tells us God's always had a witness. And when you say the gap theory uh, and believe in it, you're saying that God cannot save a remnant. Now, God's character is he always saves a remnant, whether it is uh, eight people in the ark, 70 people in Egypt with Joseph. Uh, he even says to uh, Moses, I'm going to do away with all of them and start over with you. Of course, that didn't happen, but, but God always saves a remnant. But if the gap theory were true, then God cannot save a remnant. And then, of course, we talked about this earlier, the big one, that the death of a nefesh organism could occur before human sin uh, takes it out of being biblically true. So we have these six things. God's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He can't save a remnant. He's a liar. He, he hasn't always had a witness. And death comes before human sin concerning a nefesh organism. I appreciate that response. It's a great response, uh, Dr. Grady. I've heard a lot of uh, theistic evolutionists and old earth creationists say that we can't um, show in scripture where death would also apply to animals. So I guess it's kind of a two part question. Do we as creationists apply the no death before sin to animals? And then where would we justify that from, from scripture? Well, animals can't sin and they can't be saved, but, but they are nefesh organisms. Mm. Now let's define the word nefesh. It is the Hebrew word typically translated life, soul, and blood. Indeed, the Bible says life is in the blood. In Genesis chapter 9, and I am eternally thankful for Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, um, because after the flood, though God had originally uh, made us all vegetarians, um, in Genesis 9, 3, he says, now after the flood, you shall eat meat. That, I'm eternally grateful for that. I'm a meat of <laughs> <laughs> um, but he also goes on to say, you cannot eat the flesh with the blood in it. And this is why in kosher law, slain animals must be drained as hundred percent possible. Uh, obviously there's a little remnant, but uh, as much of the, the liquid that can drain out has to be drained out. Now with that in mind, then the flesh organisms, the word life, soul, blood, soul is the intellect, the emotion and the will. Now, you have to separate biblical life and death from biological life and death. You know, as human beings, we use words in a broad spectrum the way that we use them, but it's not the way God uses them. So, in the Bible, we would agree that plants are biologically alive. They metabolize, they reproduce, but they're one-dimensional creatures, and they don't have the fish. Uh, insects fall in the same category. It is only the higher animals, starting with shrews, going up to blue whales, and humans that have nefesh. Uh, remember that animals do have emotion, intellect, and will. Now, it's limited, but they have it. You know, they can decide uh, when to walk over here or there, and they can have limitations, but they can certainly learn. And they certainly have emotions. Anybody who's ever had a dog or a cat knows that they're going to tell you, scratch my tummy and clean my box. And so they are nefesh organisms. And we are nefesh organisms. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God made the man's body, Adam's body, from the dust of the earth. So from the atoms of the earth that he had spoken into existence. But when he made the body, it was inanimate. All the tissues, organs, etc., were there, but it was not animate. And then God places the nefesh, the, what's called breath of life in the typical English translation, but life, into the body, and it becomes animate. And then, number three, God takes the spirit of Adam, prepared beforehand, and places it inside his body, and he becomes the first human being, with body, soul, and spirit. Animals don't have spirit. 
they're two-dimensional while we are a three-dimensional creature because God is a triune God. We reflect the triune nature of the triune God who made us. And the best place to see that is probably in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and 12. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says that the fate of man and beast, referring to animals, is the same. We all die. You know, I have a, I have a little statement I like to make. Nobody gets out of here alive, not even Jesus. And so when we die, the body goes in the ground. However, in Ecclesiastes 3, it says that the soul of the animal also goes into the ground and ceases to exist because they are two-dimensional. They don't have a soul. I'm sorry, they don't have a spirit connected to their soul. But in Ecclesiastes 3, and then we go to Ecclesiastes 12, 7, it says that when we die, our body goes into the ground, but our soul, which is attached to an eternal spirit, goes on and is returned to the creator who made it. And there will be a resurrection of the body later. And so there we can clearly see the difference between animals. And I hate doing this kind of presentation and talk with you because I love animals as much as any pet owner, etc. <laughs> uh, so I'm very, I'm very cognizant of it. And when I tell people that their dog is not going to be resurrected in heaven, I just hate me. But truth's truth, regardless. Now there's going to be creatures in heaven, but they're not going to be our resurrected pets. Right. Because they cease to exist when their soul goes to the ground, when the body dies. But we go on into eternity future, and of course where we go in that eternity future is dependent upon the decision we make during this life, heaven or hell. Another great informative response. Uh, Dr. Grady, you're a fan favorite. We've got over 60 people in the chat with questions flying <laughs> in. It's going to keep us busy for... <laughs> It'll keep us busy. It'll keep us busy for the next 10 hours. And I've got so many different questions coming in from all angles and all topics. So I'm doing my best uh, to the chat. I will get to your question. I'm just doing my best to keep the questions uh, related to the specific topic we're on, just so we're not jumping everywhere. So I'll get a couple more of these, <laughs> just so we're not going from biology to genetics to geology to theology. Oh, I don't mind that. But. <laughs> okay, that's, okay, well, I appreciate that because we got a lot of great questions. And here's one that is specific to what we were talking about. Um, Dr. Grady, you pointed out that um, animals would have gone from vegetarian diets to meat-eating diets. So the question here from Chris Peacock is, uh, you know, how long after the flood could everyone eat meat without causing an extinction? Well, actually, I, I, I'm going to start by pointing out to Chris, extinction is a proof of creation. You know, what is the one thing that evolutionists are so concerned about? It's extinction, which is why they want to keep more and more of a biodiversity alive. Because extinction disproves evolution. If, if evolution were true, they wouldn't be concerned about extinction at all. But we don't see any new forms coming along. So let's think about this. If evolution was true, we would have more and more creatures, the, 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 you know, the mushroom, tree, bushes of life. And the ones that became extinct would be inferior, and therefore evolutionists wouldn't worry about it. On the other hand, if creation was true, then we would start with a certain number, whatever that number was, 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. And then after creation, you have only two possibilities. You either maintain the same ones, or if we do have any extinct, we have less and less over time. Now, what do we have visually seen on Earth today? Less and less over time. That's a proof of creation. Now, in terms of life and extinction after the flood, you have to remember, the flood caused the extinction of somewhere in the area of 90% of all life forms that have ever existed on the earth. And this is a number that both creationists and evolutionists would agree with. There are plants, there are animals that, that simply didn't make it through the flood. Uh, mostly plants, uh, frankly, because the majority of animals made it through the flood. But many of them became extinct after the flood for a good variety of reasons. Now, I think that everybody's talking about dinosaurs uh, when they think about these issues. So let's talk about why did the dinosaurs become extinct? First of all, we know dinosaurs were on the ark. Uh, there are 10 references to dinosaurs in the Old Testament after the flood. 
we have human history starting with Herodotus coming up till 1883, where even evolutionists say that they saw dinosaurs. Uh, we have artifacts. We have art proving that people saw dinosaurs even into recent times. And so why did they go extinct? Well, first of all, the flood caused tremendous environmental changes. Remember that the ground became less fertile. One of the reasons was that the ground that existed before the flood was churned into mud, nutrients dissolved into water. This is why we have salt water. And the mud layers laid back down, but they were less nutritious. They had less nutrients in them because they were dissolved in the water and went into the oceans. Air pressure dropped in half, approximately. Now, we don't have the exact figures, but, but air pressure before the flood was somewhere in the areas of uh, 1.6 to 2.2 times what it is today. And so creatures like pterosaurs, which are not flyers, they're gliders, um, could not exist in, in the sizes that they once did, possibly not even able to exist at all. Um, Remember that if we have all of these plants becoming extinct at the time of the flood, for example, the earth had great lycopod forests before the flood. We know that because the, the billions of lycopod trees we find fossilized in the ground. Yet there's not a live one on earth today that we know of. Um, this is true then of a lot of other plants. Well, remember, everybody was a vegetarian. So some of the dinosaurs, being vegetarians, could no longer find the foods that they were used to and became extinct by starvation. Uh, I would also point out that uh, some dinosaurs were tasty. You know, today we still eat reptiles. Uh, here in Florida, we eat alligators. Out in the southwest part of the United States, we eat rattlesnake. Um, you know, reptiles are eaten all over the world. Well, uh, I, I like to point out to somebody, which would you rather do? kill a really big, dumb reptile uh, and feed the family for six months or try to kill a saber-toothed tiger who's just gotten a taste for meat. <laughs> and so some of them were hunted into extinction. But let's take it a little further. There were those that, that existed. Now, uh, in Job chapter 40, verse 15, this is roughly 350 years after the flood, Behemoth is clearly a dinosaur. Uh, if we take a look at Leviathan, clearly a large marine reptile mentioned five times in scripture. If you go to Psalm 91, I believe it's verse 13, uh, it talks about, in most English translations, a dragon. Um, now, the word dragon is simply the old word for dinosaur. Remember, the word dinosaur didn't come into existence until 1841. So dinosaur was the word we use in modern time. But it was dragon prior to that for most people. If we then take a look in Isaiah, again, twice he says he saw flying dragons, flying serpents, flying reptiles. Um, so these are various references. I'm just trying to point some out. But again, Herodotus, about 2400 BC, uh, about, I'm sorry, 400 BC, about 2400 years ago, talks about, again, flying dragons. It sounds very much like the uh, description of Rampharynchus, though we can't be positive about that. Um, Alexander the Great's army saw dinosaurs on their way going into northwestern India. Um, Flavius Josephus and Pliny the Elder both talk about them uh, 2,000 years ago in the first century. Um, other historians and other naturalists um, Flavius Philostratus in the uh, 300s, um, Marco Polo in the 1270s. Uh, we have in England uh, a variety of things. Uh, the Chronicles of uh, Canterbury Cathedral mention them about 1445. The cathedral at Carlisle in northern England clearly shows them. Uh, we find them depicted in art and artifacts all over the world. Figurines in Chinese uh, tombs. We see over 33,000 clay figurines of dinosaurs in Mexico that according to evolutionists are at least 1,800 to 2,800 years old. Uh, Ica stones down in Peru. 
um, the Stegosaurus at the temple at Angkor Wat. Um, we, we find these things all over the world. Um, I have been in Armenia speaking, and there's a, a church, a very ancient church there, that has a couple of dragons depicted above a window. Uh, the, the list just goes on. And so what happens? The various types of dinosaurs become extinct over a long period of time, over hundreds and hundreds of years, slowly, gradually, one here, one there. But St. George and the Dragon, I think, is a great illustration. It's a true story. It occurred in the early 300s. Now, why, why would these stories of uh, St. George and the Dragon and other dragon slayers and so forth come into existence? They're not myth. Uh, Beowulf, the great epic poetry, clearly describes a pterodactyl. Well, remember, dinosaurs are vegetarians, and they're big. Not all of them. Many of them are small. But let's just say you've got one that's uh, 20, 30 foot long, and it's a vegetarian. And you're a farmer, and you, you've got a cornfield. And this dinosaur comes across your cornfield and says, lunch. Well, that's a destruction of your income. So what are you going to do? You're going to pay somebody who's a dragon slayer to come and get, kill that reptile to protect your crops. And so some died for natural reasons of extinction, you know, no food, uh, low air pressure. Others were hunted specifically because they tasted good. Um, others were slain because they were a nuisance. But this is how they became extinct, but over hundreds and hundreds of years of time. Another great informative answer. Uh, so many good points, uh, Dr. Grady. And I, understandably, you know, I wouldn't want to live next to a family of Tyrannosaurus Rex. So uh, it wouldn't be too now, wait long. A minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you had <laughs> lived from creation to the flood as a young boy, you could have a T-Rex as a pet. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good Remember point. Remember the sharp claws and sharp teeth do not immediately make. I even did a video on that. It's available on our website. But, but evolutionists have deceived people into believing that sharp teeth, sharp claws make it a meat eater, a carnivore. The blunt claws, blunt teeth make it a vegetarian. That is simply not true. Many, many animals with sharp teeth and sharp claws are, in fact, 100% vegetarian or omnivorous. After all, bears survive a great deal on vegetative material. We recently found that web-making spiders supplement their spider-eating diet of insects 25% by eating pollen, which is vegetarian. 13 of the 18 species of crocodile alive today do eat fruits and vegetables to supplement their diet. So sharp claws and sharp teeth do not immediately make. Well, if, if I could ask you, Dr. Grady, because I've even heard this from old earth creationists, they'll say, okay, um, you know, we say that animals uh, pre-fall and, and uh, pre-flood were vegetarian, and therefore they'll say the changes uh, necessary both in, in genetics and in, um, in phenotype, I guess, would be too great to go from plant eating to meat eating. Is that, is that really an issue to, to, to have those adaptive episodes after the flood? Okay, let's knock it out of the park. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> I have, in my DVD on sharp claws and sharp teeth, do not immediately make. I show within the last, oh, well, actually less than 75 years, two vegetarian eating lions. So lions can get by on vegetation just fine. Now, we tend to think of them as being pure meat eaters, but that's right. not true. And in World War II at the London Zoo, to keep their big cats alive, they served them lettuce. Now, I'm simply trying to point out that, again, what these people are not taking into consideration, if they are old earth, they do not believe that God is omniscient or omnipotent, correct? But think about this. How great is a God who can make creatures like us and we can survive on vegetation? Now, that's a great God. That's a great designer, creator, intelligence. But how much greater 
is a God that can create us as vegetarians, knowing that we will become meat eaters later and giving us the genetics to be able to survive on both and become omnivorous. That's a greater God. So first of all, they have a small God. Right, Secondly, right. what's the possibility of the following? Now, God in his foreknowledge knew that though he started us as vegetarians, Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, but knew that after the flood, because of the changes that I've just described that caused many of the dinosaurs to become extinct, that we would have to now eat meat. Because remember the prophecy, because of your sin, the ground will become less fertile. Now, God knows this. And so he's got a plan. Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of people who call themselves vegetarians, but I would point out that there's a difference between a vegan and a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Now, a vegan eats plants only, period, end of statement. I would advise them to stop doing that, but it's a personal advice. Most vegetarians are not eating vegetables only. Most vegetarians supplement their diet with some animal proteins, eggs, cheese, milk, um, other things, uh, fish, maybe they don't just, maybe they just don't eat red meat, but they might eat fish. They might eat chicken or fowl. Um, but why? Because of the flood, because of human sin causing decay in all systems. The food has become less and less nutritious over time. Now, it is almost impossible to be a vegan and get all the amino acids that you actually need to be a healthy human being. Because those amino acids include those made by animals that you simply can't get from plants anymore. Therefore, I point out that a vegan lifestyle is something you want to be very careful about. Uh, at least supplement it with pills and nothing else. Um, and so, again, their, their old earth argument falls apart when we talk about an omniscient God who can design us to do one thing initially and allow us without changing our bodies, without, you know, making us some kind of morphed into some other kind of creature, be able to eat meat too. And that's because of his foreknowledge. Amen. Amen. It makes me think of uh, these epigenetic changes that we're seeing in organisms where they enter new environments and you have rapid adaptive change. It's evidence, as you've uh, pointed out, it's evidence of a forward thinker, a forward planner. It's just like why GM would build a car with both a heater and an air conditioner. Well, if you if you need the heater, you can turn the heater on. If you need the air conditioner, you can turn the air conditioner on. It's forward thinking. Great points, Dr. Grady. Well, you got to have the car work in all different kinds of environments, not just one. Right. Although I would remind you, I think it was in the 1960s, it might have been in the early 70s, that in Miami, you could still buy a car without a heater to save money. Right. <laughs> right. Good point. Good point. So uh, I'm going to try and uh, I've got a lot of questions here based on the magnetic field uh, sure. point we we're talking about. So I'm just going to kind of condense them all into maybe one question if I can. Uh, so this question came in and uh, the question, Dr. Grady, is why does the seabed have multiple positive and negative magnetic properties? if the uh, magnetic field does not switch. Yeah, no, no, I understand the question completely. Okay. The description is not quite adequate, uh, but uh, I know what they're talking about. And they're okay. simply saying that evolution say that, uh, again, the fields have changed north, south, and back. And then they say that there's positive, negative, uh, in the sense of magnetism, uh, lines in the Atlantic Ocean, particularly uh, spreading from the Mid-Atlantic Trench. Now, the fact of the matter is, uh, I'm sorry, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The fact is that it's not as clear cut as they think it is. They're looking at a surface map, but if you take the core samples that have been done going east and west from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, what you find is that the pluses and minuses don't fit what evolutionists are claiming. So let's think about this. If evolutionists were right and millions of years had passed, and if the field went one way for a while and then reversed and went the other way, so that's the plus and negative, then we should find layers, one layer going north, one layer going south, 
on top of each other and then again and again and again. But that's not the way it works. The fact of the matter is the core samples prove that these are random pluses and minuses and research has proven that where you have two pluses next to each other, you will actually cause a negative to be formed in between them by induction. And so those core samples disprove that evolutionary failure tale of the reversal of fields. It's a great response. And it, it, it makes me, um, it makes me think that just with this line of evidence, the decaying magnetic field, the rescue devices put forth by the critics and the proponents of, of deep time evolution and an old earth, they've all been looked at and they've all been analyzed and they all fail. Well, that's just it. You see, even the teachers of evolution, and, and this is one of my big problems with, and I'm a teacher, but a big problem with public school education primarily is that when teachers become teachers, what they do is they tend to, teach the same thing that they were taught for the next 40 years. Um, Stephen Jay Gould was asked about this, and I'll just give this a sort of a, a, a aside here, but uh, he was approached. Now, this is one of the world's truly greatest evolutionary uh, historians and paleontologists, and he was approached, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing the story, but um, with the question, well, you know what's in the textbook is wrong. And he said, well, yes, that's true, but we've got to publish something until we find out what's right. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, somebody shows them a surface map of the ocean floor and says, what's well, minus plus, minus plus, and so forth. But the fact of the matter is it's blotchy, and the it shouldn't have layers, but it doesn't. Uh, there's pluses and minuses in the same elevation. Um, and so when we take a look at it in detail, it falls apart. It's, again, a house of cards. You pull out one card, the whole thing falls. Right. They're always trying to uh, come up with a way to rescue the, the paradigm. And uh, we spoke last time in great deal on uh, genetic entropy, mutation accumulation, yes. and how mutation yes. accumulation puts shelf lives on, on genomes, which I think is a, is a phenomenal um, uh reason as to why universal common ancestry can't can't be true can you kind of expand on that uh dr grady on the genetic entropy yes yeah well uh, yeah and, and i'll give you some really good information um since the human genome project was completed in april of 2003 uh, we now know that we are losing one to two percent of our genetic information per generation Entropy is a measure of the, the loss of, of organization in the system. It, it's going from highly structured to very simple by natural decay. And so entropy is a measurement of the decay in a system. So we know now from genetic research that we are losing genetic information. Now, if, if evolution were true, we should be getting bigger, better, faster, smarter. The truth is that science has shown that we're getting smaller, slower, and dumber. Now, we are losing 1% to 2% of our genetic information per generation. Now, it's like a snowball going downhill. It started with very small, very minute mistakes called mutations in the Garden of Eden after human sin. But like a snowball going downhill over centuries and millennia, the snowball gets bigger and bigger. So initially, let's say we had one uh, genetic loss per generation, but now it's one to two percent, and of course, that's going to simply increase over time. And we know that this includes the genes associated with intelligence, so it's absolutely true that your great grandparents were smarter individually and had faster reaction times individually than we do today. We are adding approximately 60 new mutations per generation. Now, it can be as high as 100 in an individual case, but a mutation is a copying error. It's a loss of previously existing information. It loses it, it scrambles it up, it destroys it, it corrupts it. But mutations are the thing that evolutionists claim in biology produces upward progressive evolution, an increase in intelligence, or complexity by round chance. 
the fact of the matter is that mutations always eventually go downhill. I'd like to give you a number. Um, Dr. Jerry Bergman, who, like myself, has a couple of doctorates, and he's a creation scientist and has written tons of books and hundreds of articles, uh, is really great on this stuff. I, I'll read anything, you know, I'll read anything he writes. Um, in talking about this, he did some research, and he went out and looked at the two largest categories of known catalog mutations on Earth, plants, animals, people. He found about a half a million known mutations, and we know how to actually make some of them happen on demand. Um, and out of that almost a half a million, he only found 186, which were not detrimental, but they were not beneficial either. We used to call them neutral mutations, but evolution today has switched the terminology to functional mutations, where there's a change, but it, it has no deleterious or beneficial effect. It's just a change. Um, it's like, uh, you know, words like ABBA, A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. Well, you can reverse the A's, you can reverse the B's. It's still the same thing. And yet you change the position of the letters. So. In looking at that, he found 186 that were not deleterious. Now, if you do the math, that means that 99.97% of all mutations are either lethal or cause a severe defect, such as sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, and so forth, genetic diseases that are survived. But most mutations are lethal to start with. So much good information there, um, Dr. McMurtry. And, you know, that's why genetic entropy, the reality of genetic entropy is, is such a huge problem for those that want to hold to this kind of fish to fisherman evolution is because, as you pointed out, most of these mutations, the majority of them, the 60 to 100 that accumulate are nearly neutral as in they're invisible to selection. Selection can't see them and therefore remove them. So they build up. Well, and they build up across the entire genome. Right. And they're passed on into the next generation. And there's no corrective mechanism. So random chance is not going to correct the typical mutation. And so these things accumulate. Like I said, over time, maybe one a generation now, it's 60 to 100 a generation. And it's just going to get worse. And it affects us both just biologically in our life, but also in our intelligence. I've heard them say that although selection can't see these slightly deleterious mutations, they'll say eventually they'll build up enough where Mother Nature will then be able to see the damage and remove the damage and thus solving okay. this problem. What's your thoughts on that? Well, you've used this word selection a couple of times. And I'm, I'm sorry, you know, love you like a brother, but we've got to correct you here. <laughs> no problem. First of all, there is no Mother Nature it's just like Santa Claus. I'm sorry if there's any children listening. Um, <laughs> secondly, nature cannot select anything. Nature does not have intelligence. And for that reason, the concepts of natural selection are false. Um, you may not be aware of this, but Wallace actually stood Darwin up in a letter and said that this is a meaningless terminology because there's no such thing. Now, remember that if Wallace had gotten home from, from Asia first and published first, we wouldn't call it Darwinism. We'd call it Wallaceanism. And so Wallace was just a really nice guy, and he, he let Darwin get away with it. Uh, but Dar Darwin was not a nice guy. And, well, there is no such thing as natural selection. The truth of it is what we have is natural preservation. Mm. Think with me for a moment. The creator God that we worship made like a, a billiard table, flat surface. And on the flat surface, he placed various environments. So here's the polar environment. You know, here's the subtropical, tropical island environment versus continental, etc. And what happens is called natural elimination, leading to natural preservation. 
Because what happens is God gives creatures, I don't care whether it's bacteria, rats, bats, horses, cows, blue whales, people. He gives us talents and uh, abilities, etc. Now, what happens is if we can survive in a particular environment, we survive. But if we don't have the tools to survive in a particular environment, we are eliminated. And this is why we have two bears, male, female, coming off the ark, producing polar bears and Asian black bears, uh, we're called moon bears or fruit bears, um, grizzlies, etc., is not because of natural selection. It's because of natural elimination. Think with me for a moment. Uh, we have one pair of bears on the ark. God picked them. And what he did was he took the male and female that had the least degraded genetic formation mm -hmm. to give them the best shot, so to speak. Now, the bears weren't perfect because they had suffered mutations for 1,656 years. But he took the ones with the least mutations to give them the best shot. And then they come off the ark and they start to reproduce and the bears start doing what the bears do. And they start walking in different directions because they're very territorial. And so they start dispersing. And what happens? Well, some bears over a period of no more than one, 200 years, 300 at the most, um, go to the Northern environments, what we think of as polar. Now, remember that uh, there were no ice caps before the flood. There was no ice and snow before the flood. Um, and so what happens? They go to the north, and initially they don't have a problem, but, of course, the Ice Age comes along. And now up in the north we've got ice. Now, a black bear trying to find food would stand out like a sore thumb. And for that reason, they die for lack of food. But a lighter-colored bear has a little more camouflage, you know, and so with that little bit of camouflage, they, they're able to find prey and they tend to reproduce. But again, what happens? Well, there's the darker ones of their cubs die by starvation and the lighter ones survive. And eventually you produce a white bear. And think about polar bears. They have incredibly small ear flaps versus the bears that live in the tropics. Now, why is that? Well, because large ears would be detrimental in a polar environment because you'd get frostbite, disease, and die. So the smaller the ear flaps, the better the survival rate. And so nature is eliminating big-eared big -eared bears. Nature is eliminating dark-colored bears in the polar environments. But what happens in Asia? Well, a white bear in Asia would stick out like a sore thumb, and so its prey would easily know it was coming, and it would starve to death. And so the darker the bear, the more likely it will survive and not be eliminated. And so this is why we have the different kinds of, of bears around the world. And so it is not natural selection. It is natural elimination leading to natural preservation. I like that. I really like that, Dr. Grady. Some great points there. And, and therefore, and correct me if I'm wrong, as you were pointing out, uh, you know, God would have sent the uh animals to the ark that had the least amount of genetic load least amount of mutation build up and i'm sure you've heard this argument over the years over and over again they'll say that uh, a literal genesis cannot be true because at creation for example god only created two people and therefore there would have been inbreeding but the question is were there mutations at creation that could even lead to those negative effects at uh, dr grady well, first of all, mutations don't occur until human sin. That's when things mm -hmm. start to degrade. That's, that's the genetic entropy point. However, again, these people don't have a big God. They have a small God. Now, let's think again of a God who's omniscient. When he made the one man and one woman, we call them Adam and Eve, he gave them perfect genetic information as human beings. Not perfect information as bears, but perfect information as human beings. And in their genetic information, allowing for variation to go lighter and darker, say, in skin, bigger and smaller in ears, 
taller and shorter in height. Um, with straight hair, curly hair, they had all that information in those two bodies. And then as they have children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, we do start to get mutations. We do start to get loss of information, but we also get the differentiation that will lead to people looking different. Now, before the flood, it was still a very homogeneous population because they were freely mixing. It is only after the flood and after the Tower of Babel experience that we then start to develop ethnicity. There is no such thing as different human races. You're either human or you're not. You're either a descendant of Adam and Eve or you're not human. You're either a descendant of Noah, his wife, their three sons, their three wives, or you're not human. And God put all of that genetic information in Adam and Eve's body. I can truthfully say this scientifically. If the information was not in the body of Adam and Eve, it's not in you. Because nature will not produce new information. Nature only eliminates previously existing. It corrupts, damages, destroys previously existing information, but doesn't make anything new. And so after the Tower of Babel, after we have the three tribes that come from the three sons of Noah, we get ethnicity because of the barriers that God placed by language. When God gave the 70 languages, he separated the human population, which was at that point still very homogeneous, but into 70 small inbreeding groups. And because of that, again, in one population, tall people outproduce short people, eliminating the information for short people. And you only get tall people. In another population, short people outreproduced tall people and eliminated the information for tall people. In, in a population, uh, dark-skinned people outreproduced light-skinned people, eliminating the light-skinned people. But remember that that's simply melanin. That's just a genetic thing called melanin, a p skin pigment. And so it's just the amount of it that gives you that color. It's not that you're a race of human being at all. And so what happens is by elimination in various populations, we get ethnicity. As a matter of fact, that's the word used in the New Testament is ethnos. Another great, great answer, answer um, um, Dr. Dr. Grady. Grady. Uh, let me um, see. I think I might be echoing. Okay, so okay, I've got, got it. Oh, I'm oh, hearing an echo. I'm not sure if that's, give me one second. Okay, I think it's okay. We're good. Um, so here's a question based on the natural selection uh, question or answer, Dr. Grady. And uh, it's a tough one. So Redefine Living says, wait, no Santa. Well, then who brings all those gifts? So unfortunately, we had to break the news to. Uh... <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm sorry. He's so young and disillusioned. Uh... <laughs> um, so great responses there. And, I, know, I know who brings all those gifts. Amazon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially these days, it seems like a new Amazon package is coming to the door every single day. Um, so here's a question, and I'm kind of looking through um, the dozens of questions I have here. So I guess a question that I have for you, Dr. McMurtry, is a common argument put forth for evolution. This was actually even put forth for from uh, William Lane Craig as to why he believes humans and uh, apes or chimpanzees are related. He will say that um, there exists genetic mistakes or pseudogenes between humans and, and chimpanzees, and therefore that declares a relationship. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And what's a good way to refute that argument? Well, there are genes that we do find in different creatures that are shared because God is a infinite creator. And for instance, uh, instead of a gene uh, or pseudogene, so forth, let's just for a moment uh, think of your hand. Just, just everybody in the audience, just take your hand and look at it. This is called the pendactyl pattern, the five digit pattern. We find this universally in nature. You know, we find it in cats, dogs, um, the, the bones in your hand are the exact same bones that are in the leg of a horse, a bat's wing, the, the flipper of a whale. Why? 
this is one really good design. And we teach this in engineering universities. You take a really good design and then you modify it for many different purposes. Now, when you take a look at your hand, it's the exact same bones that you have in your foot. Metacarpals, metatarsals, um, and the only difference in the leg of a horse and the flipper of a whale or uh, the wing of a bird or a bat is the size, uh, length, size, and shape of those bones, but they're the same bones. So it's one really good pattern used across a lot of nature, right? In the same way, there are genes that we find in many different creatures. Now, let's then take a look at this ape human thing. Again, I point out to you that William Lane Craig is totally out of his depth. He is a sold out old earther, and he will believe anything they tell him that makes him feel like he's right. But let's just take a look at this genetic information, these pseudogenes and so forth. When we take a look at the actual genetic similarity between apes and people, it's not there. See, evolutionists made up a fairy tale for adults. It started, I think, in 1999. Uh, and not because it was 1999, but they made up a story that ape and human DNA was 99% the same. I'm sure you've heard this. And it led to the story that uh, humans and apes shared 96, 97, 98, 99% of the same DNA. Now, I, I've got a DVD on, quote, the road to man, unquote, question mark, question mark, question mark, did apes actually evolve into people? And I show how you can disprove the, the methodology and uh, the lack of evidence for this. But at the end of the DVD, I do something. You see, what I did was I took a look at the science. You see... Uh, evolutionists don't look at the science, it's a religion. Uh, creationists, we do look at the science. Now, I'm going to, off the top of my head, tell you the figures that I can remember specifically. Um, human beings and bananas share 50% the same DNA. Now, the last time I looked, banana is a vegetable. You are 60% the same as a chicken. 35% the same as a daffodil. Um, you are 88% um, the same genetically as a rat. You are um, 70, what was it, 70% the same as a uh, sea sponge. So if we're going to compare organisms by the similarity of their genetics, um, it turns out that humans are only 70% the same as apes, but we're 88% the same as rats. And we are 88% the same as a sea squirt. Now, if you don't know what a sea squirt is, it's technically an animal by biological definition, but once a young sea squirt's swimming in the ocean water, it has a brain. But as a adult sea squirt, it attaches to the sea floor, converts into a filter feeder like corals and sponges, and the brain dissolves away. And as an adult, it doesn't have a brain. Now, you're 88% the same genetically as a sea squirt. You're 88% the same as a rat, but you're only 70% the same as an ape. So who are you closer to? Right, good point. Great point. That that brings me to this question that came in that's very similar to, to what you're uh, talking about here in terms of these similarities and also the differences uh, shared among all, all forms of life. And the question comes in from Andrew Cumming. And his, his question, Dr. Grady, is, I would like to hear Dr. Grady's reason or reasons why a nested hierarchy exists according to the young earth creation model those groups within groups patterns uh dr gravy makes me suspicious I'm, I'm not saying that this gentleman is but makes me suspicious that he's an evolutionary cladist uh that's what it kind of sounds like <laughs> uh, if i'm wrong please forgive me i didn't right. mean to label you incorrectly but the fact of the matter is that simply because you can make things appear to have come from something else 
it's a false proof called the proof by ranking. Now that's what cladists do. It's a false right. proof called the proof by ranking. So the proof by ranking, for those that are not familiar with it, to rank a series of objects is to put them in a logical order or a logical sequence. So when we put a little ape and then followed by a bigger ape and then a bigger ape and then supposedly something pre-human and then finally a human, that's a ranking. That's a logical order or sequence of illustrations. But in fact, it's stage magic. It's the illusion. Simply because they create this illusion doesn't make it true, just like any other stage magic. And that's why I gave you the genetic information to prove that this form of ranking doesn't prove anything. So what they do is they simply line things up by size and shape, deceive you, illusion, into believing that one came from the other. But the fact of the matter is it doesn't prove anything. Uh, if I were to, for instance, take a room with 100 people, just 100 random people, you know, not related necessarily, but just 100 random people off the street, as they say, and I were to line them up by their height only, so shortest on one end, tallest on the other end, what two things would I have proved then scientifically? I would have proved that people come in different heights and that I have the intelligence to do this. Or if I took the exact same 100 people, and this time I line them up in a rank, a logical order or sequence, but I don't do it by their height, this time I'm going to do it by the month and the day of the month they were born. I don't care what year they were born. I don't care what their age is. I don't care what their gender is. I don't care what the height is. Just the month and the day of the month that you were born. And so I line them up and I start with January the 1st and I go to December the 31st. And in 100 people, I'll find out that two of them have the same birthday. But that's just a consequence of this process. But what have I done? I have proven that people are born on different days of the year, and I have the intelligence to line things up in a certain criteria. But in lining them up by their height, or lining them up by the month and day of the year that they were born, did I prove anything about their heritage? And the answer is no. I didn't prove that any two of them were married to each other. I didn't prove that either there's any fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, or cousins. I have simply not proved anything about their heritage. And uh, you're up in Canada. Um, I mentioned that only because I'm not sure about Canada. But um, we have a lot of hunters in the States, uh, you know, like to hunt deer and eat deer and so forth. Um, if I were to go out in the woods and I found the skeleton of a deer, and let's assume it died from natural causes, okay? <laughs> If there were enough bones left of the skeleton when I found it, I might be able to tell whether it was a male or female at death. Uh, the teeth would give me a good idea of how old it was, give or take, say, one year. You know, um, But when I found the skeleton, could I prove scientifically that it ever had children? Well, the answer is no. No, right. You see, this is a totally useless method of proof. It's, it's what I refer to. It's the worst method of proof in science. Well, it's the second worst method of proof, really. It's the second worst method of proof in science, but it's their favorite method of proof. They line things up by size and shape all the time. But please notice, it's usually illustrations. Now, remember, you can draw anything you want to. So drawing doesn't prove anything either. But this idea that you can line things up by size and shape and prove anything is simply not true. Uh, I even have a... Uh, not not a bet or a wager. I have a proposition. Do we understand the difference? <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I'm not a betting person. Don't condone it. But if you were to give me one skull each of a thousand real animals. Now, there's about 10,000 real animal types. And I'm talking about you know, large land animals and whales and so forth. Um but if you gave me one skull each of a thousand real creatures, so a, a, a skull of a, a shrew, a rat, a cat, a dog, a horse, a cow, an elephant, you know, whatever. But you gave me a, one skull each of a thousand real different animals. I would pick and choose the skulls, line them up by size and shape, and prove to you that apes did not evolve into people. They evolved into whales. Hmm. 
or I could pick and choose from the same 1,000 skulls. Uh, and this also is with skeletons. I'm just using skulls as the easiest thing for people to, to think about. But I could, again, pick and choose from those 1,000 skulls and prove to you that apes did not evolve into people. Uh, they actually evolved into giraffes. The ability to line things up by size and shape proves absolutely nothing about their heritage. That's a fantastic response, uh, Dr. Greedy. And, and I'm glad that we had the chance to answer that. And I'm glad you were so detailed because as you pointed out, and, and I've noticed this as well, this is almost now their go-to argument, lining things up and categorizing things based on similarities and therefore... And and while the audience may not realize that hierarchy is what he was talking about, that's what it really is. Right. And for the evolutionists, they talk about clads. But that is just lining things up by size and shape to deceive you into believing that one came from another. But the truth of the matter is that between each kind is a great void. Right. Exactly. No matter whether we're, it's alive or dead and fossilized, we have never found anything that's halfway from this to that. Every time we find a creature, dead or alive, it is a unique, specific kind that reproduces only after its own kind and does not produce something else. I mean, here's another little ditty for the ones that are listening. You know, if evolutionists really believed what they say they believe, then they would plant tomatoes and expect to get corn. Right. Right. And I find it funny because they'll look to these arguments pertaining to like homology or nested hierarchical patterns. Right. But then they ignore the evidence that you were pointing to earlier, Dr. Grady, with mutation accumulation, genetic entropy, and the fact that this reality puts shelf lives on genomes. So they can line things up any way they want. But the actual empirical data, mutations, which they look to, um, as a way to explain novelty actually degenerates. Organisms are going downhill. It's the degeneration that right. they actually see. but trying to delude you, to deceive you into believing that somehow or another the God of random chance can produce order, but the God of random chance only produces chaos. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well said. I am. Uh, we've got a great chat. We've had over 70 people as well. So we got questions still flying in. I'm doing my best to uh, save them as, as they come in. So I appreciate your detailed answers, um, Dr. Grady. What I'll do is I'll kind of shift now towards because we got a lot of questions pertaining to the global flood as well, uh, which is a great topic. Um, so we'll kind of start, I guess, with this question, going back to the Bible first, as that's our final authority. Um, Dr. Grady, does the Bible teach, because we know there's some compromisers that say it teaches a local flood. Therefore, the question is, does the Bible teach a global or local flood? Well, the Bible absolutely teaches a global flood. That The flood of Noah was global. If you will read chapter 7 and chapter 9 of Genesis, God says in chapter 7, I am going to wipe out all life on the dry land except those preserved in the ark. And in chapter 9, he says, I wiped them all out, except those that were on the ark. That's global. After all, in a local flood, why build an ark anyway? If, if a flood, a local flood came along and wiped out a few thousand or tens of thousands of animals, I mean, let's face it, uh, as you know, in Canada, squirrels will reproduce squirrels. <laughs> exactly. Um, again, um, it cannot be local. You know, why build the the ark to begin with why not just walk away after all he had a hundred years uh, to build the ark he had a 120 year warning of the flood coming and again god says i will never again flood the earth as i did in the time of noah well we've had what several hundred thousand local floods since then um but when we go to psalm 104 now in genesis chapter 7 8 9 we are dealing with a description of the flood in Psalm 104, verses 5 through 9, we have the chronology of the flood. So if you take a look at Psalm 104, verses 5 and 6, God sends a worldwide flood, verse 5. In verse 6, he says that the water was standing above the mountains. Now, if we go back again to Genesis chapter 7, 8, 9, 
it says that the highest piece of land that existed prior to the flood was covered by at least what we would say 21 and a half feet of water. That is then consistent with verse 6 that says that the, the water was covering the mountains everywhere. Now, if the water is covering the mountains, it's at least going to slop over into the next valleys. I think you're going to give me that one. In verse 7, he says, then the waters go away. Uh, verse 8, then the mountains rise up, the valleys sink down. Verse 9, God promises, I'll never again flood the earth with water. And then we take a look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, in the Greek language, when Peter's describing the flood, he said the earth was cataclysmically. This is the English word that he uses in the Greek, uh, cataclysmal, um, that it is cataclysmically destroyed. This is not a local flood. This is a global flood. So in Genesis, in Psalm 104, in Second Peter chapter 3, this is a global, not a local flood that's being described. Amen. Well said, well said. So, th so therefore, uh, because I believe a lot of these compromisers, and, and I think it's pretty clear that they start with, with science, where they believe that science says a worldwide flood is not possible. And then therefore, they will kind of read their own ideas into the text instead of reading uh, what the text is actually saying. So the question would be then, uh, Dr. Grady, is there scientific data that supports a worldwide flood as oh, absolutely. in the Bible. Oh, I mean, the evidence of a worldwide flood is all around you. I mean, it is everywhere. Now, let's just take a look at some of the things. Um, in the textbooks when they teach evolution in school, whether it was elementary, junior, senior, high school, college, uh, they show you layers in the ground and give them various names. You know, uh, this is the Cretaceous period, you know, Jurassic period, and then they, they divide that down into various layers and so forth. And they show it to you in a nice, neat order. And then typically they'll decorate it with illustrations of creatures that are supposed to have lived at different times. I think everybody has clearly seen that kind of a presentation. It all looks fine and good on paper, but again, it's a stage illusion. It's magic. Now, it's not black magic. It's white magic. It's, it's illusion. Because, as I question people, I say, when you got out of school, how many of you actually went out and dug on the ground to see whether or not they were telling you the truth? And I'm the first one to admit to you, it wasn't until I got out of college with my first degree in evolution that I started looking in the ground and realizing that what they claimed wasn't what was there. Now, the, the, don't misunderstand me. The layers in the ground, there's fossils in many of the layers and so forth, and the layers do tend to fit a certain pattern uh, with we see dead creatures preserved in them becoming more complex generally as we get higher in the elevation. However, however, there are millions of exceptions to that. For instance, many times we find the layers upside down, backwards, missing. We have polystrate fossils which penetrate many layers which could not possibly have been slow and gradual process. We take a look at the Grand Canyon. Evolutionists will say, oh, there's 500 million years of time recorded in the layers of Grand Canyon. But what they don't tell you is there's 160 million years missing. They don't tell you about all the exceptions to those generalized rules. They don't tell you about polystrate fossils. And as a matter of fact, almost all fossils are polystrate by definition. Because a polystrate fossil is any fossil which penetrates two or more layers. Well, many layers are only a millimeter thick. What about all those animals we find that are articulated? Meaning that the bones didn't all fall apart, that the bodies, the, the flesh rotted off, but the bodies are still in the articulation as, as they would be if they were alive. And those rib cages, if, if an animal dies in the ground and the, the flesh rots, the bones fall apart and they all fall on the ground in a big jumble pile. But what we find is millions and millions of creatures that are articulated in the same position as when they fell down or were standing up and buried, um, proving that this is not a slow and gradual process. This was a rapid process. Uh, fossilization itself uh, is not a slow and gradual process. Again, this is a deception of evolutionists who tell you it takes millions of years to get a fossil. It's simply not true. Now, I grew up on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley. I didn't 
get a degree at Berkeley, but I went to school in Berkeley as a child, and I grew up on the campus at Berkeley because my father was a professor there. And, you know, I learned a lot about evolutionary theory, fossils, etc., as a child in the paleontology laboratories at Berkeley. And they want to show you all these things, and then they make up their fairy tales for adults. But what they don't tell you about is all those exceptions. And so when you find out about all the exceptions that don't fit, and how about, again, upside down layers. Now, uh, there's a mountain in Montana. And Chief Mountain has a block, uh, a good-sized block of, pre of uh, Precambrian limestone. The fossils in it are purely single cell and supposedly more than 500 million years old. But it sits directly on top of Cretaceous material that's supposedly only about 110 million years old. Well, they're upside down backwards, and there's roughly 1.4 billion years missing in between. And there's no evidence physically that they have ever moved once they were deposited. They are sedimentary layers. They're mud. They were laid down by water in the same place that we see them today. I find it amazing when these uh, skeptics or critics actually make that claim, uh, Dr. Grady, that there's just no evidence for worldwide flood, when in fact we could spend the next month here discussing in detail all these lines of evidence for a worldwide flood, including that which you've... you've well, mentioned. and again, we find many of the layers folded. We find flat layers standing straight up, you know, they're vertical when they should be horizontal going to evolutionists. Uh, all of these things are discrepancies in their story that prove that their story is not true. Right. Amen. Well, here's a question and here's a common objection um, that I'm sure you've heard over and over again as well, Dr. Grady. So the question is, critics of the global flood assert that there is just far too much coal on the planet to have ever been the result of a single worldwide flood. What is the best response to this uh, to this argument? <laughs> Well, again, I want to introduce you to two terms. Evolutionists use what they call historical geology. And they, they believe in evolution and they tell their fairy tales about the layers in the ground, including the coal layers. And, of course, they talk about the Carboniferous period, primarily divided into the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian periods on the geological time scale. And they say that this is 300 to 360 million, suppose, years ago. However, uh, we found out how to make coal in a laboratory in a matter of hours. We saw coalification occur at Mount Silent Helens within just a few years after the eruption in 1980. Uh, any farmer worth their salt will tell you that if they dig up a, an old wooden fence post, the bottom of it is often fossilized. I show pictures of fossil hats. I show pictures of uh, fossil fish. Now, I'm a full-time missionary, and when COVID doesn't get in the way, I go all over the world teaching, and, and I've made 16 annual trips to Brazil. And in Brazil, in the Santana Formation, we have found fish, which evolutionary-believing paleontologists, being honest and making straight scientific observation of the evidence from them, said the fish had fossilized, and that was the cause of death. Now, if you can die from fossilization, it's a rapid process, not a slow one. And we find rapidly formed fossils all over the world. I show pictures of a coil of rope fossilized in the Czech Republic. And it, it literally only took a couple months. Um, we used to show fossil teddy bears. Now, they came from England. But, but the fact of the matter is, it doesn't take long to fossilize anything. As a matter of fact, it's a rapid process, not a slow one, and it must be rapid. It cannot be slow. There's only three requirements for fossilization of an organism that has been alive in the past at any time. Rapid burial, and only water buries well, wind doesn't. You have to have what's called anaerobic decomposition, meaning there's no oxygen or bacteria would cause the rot of the creature. And it must remain undisturbed. Time pressure, and heat are not factors in fossilization. That's a great detailed response and an important answer um, 
Dr. McMurtry, because it really is just a common objection. It's almost a guaranteed objection that the critics are going to bring up, whether uh, it's a discussion or debate. So that's a great response. And uh, one thing I'll point out is even their their most favorite arguments or what they think is is the best objections, as, as you're demonstrating here tonight, they have very plausible scientific answers. Again, I would point out, Simply because something is plausible, simply because something is logical, doesn't make it true. And again, this concept uh, of uh, illusion, magic, and trying to prove evolution is true and deceiving people into believing it. Again, if you have a tendency to want to believe any, in evolution anyway, if you are looking for a reason not to believe in God, you, you want to believe in evolution. That's the sole purpose of believing in evolution. Um, then you're going to be easily deceived by these fairy tales to say, oh, yeah, well, that's, yeah, well, yeah, that. But again, when we take a look at this under the light of science, it all falls apart. Uh, the single greatest proof that they use for evolution, they're, they're, that what I call the worst proof in science, is storytelling. Charles Darwin did that in his book. I quoted in my book on creation. Uh, he told a story about there was a gentleman who had visited the United States and he saw bears swimming across a lake. And of course, as bears would do, they were snapping at the insects above the water that were bothering them. And Charles Darwin didn't see it himself, but he said, based on this description, he saw no reason why, if there was no predator in the area that could better the bears, that eventually this process would lead to bears getting bigger and bigger mouths until a bear had his mouth as big as a whale. That's storytelling. Right. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, storytelling. Darwin's books are full of storytelling. No, mm -hmm. if this, if we suppose that, and he, he is simply trying to convince people into believing it, even though it's not true. Right. Great response. There's a lot of imagination, fairy tales, and storytelling when it comes to the uh, you know evolutionary theory. It shouldn't even be called a theory. So those are some great points. Um, well, you're right. It shouldn't be called a theory because it's not even a good working hypothesis, right. which is what you've got to have before it can become a theory. Right. Exa exactly right. Um, I'm, I'm looking through these questions, and I guess here's another couple pertaining to the flood. And uh, this has been so great, Dr. McMurtry. So again, I want to thank you for, for your time. We've had a great chat the entire time with so many good questions. And uh, here's another here's another common one, and, and I think a good question. And it is, uh, Dr. Grady, can the global flood model explain rapid plant growth after, after the food, uh, after the flood? Well, I mean, plants grow rapidly anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Regardless, um, but I would point out something if you've not read in detail the story of the flood. Remember that the flood begins uh, in early November. And the waters rise for 150 days, and the ark comes to rest, Genesis 8, 4, on the 17th day of the month of Nisan. Now, that's in late March or early April on our calendar. And then the waters recede for 150 days. So the length and duration of the flood was 150 days up, 150 days down. The entire earth was not covered with water instantaneously. It was a gradual process of the waters rising and receding. Um, some land existed as dry land well into the flood, but the water levels were rising. So the, the mountains became islands, the islands became islets, and eventually covered with water. Now, uh, with that then in, in mind, when we take a look at the flood and the story that we have, it says that they stayed in the ark a total of 70 days after the water receded. So from the time the flood begins to the time that Noah opens the door is a total of 370 days. Now, in the Jewish calendar, that's one year plus 10 days. So they stay in the ark for 70 days. Now, why? As I like to say, why would you want to stay in the ark with anywhere from 1,800 to 17,500 animals? We don't know, but somewhere in there. Uh, stinking animals um, for an extra 70 days. Well, there are two very good reasons. Number one, the earth is covered with wet mud layers in places miles deep. 
you simply cannot walk out or you'd sink in. But remember the story of the two birds. Remember, the raven goes out and does not return because it's omnivorous. It can live on decaying dead bodies outside the ark. It doesn't have to come back for food. But the dove is a 100% vegetarian. And so the dove goes out, can't find any food, and comes back. But then it goes back out, and it finds and plucks the leaf from a freshly germinated olive tree and brings it back. This is proof that all those seeds buried in those wet mud layers had germinated and grown over a 70-day period. And now there was enough food to allow the animals to live outside of the ark. Remember, they're vegetarians, basically. And so the 70 days to let the earth surface dry out hard enough to walk on it and to allow the seeds to germinate and provide food for the animals. Another great response, uh, Dr. Grady. So a, a follow up to that, then, given the animals that were brought on board the ark, and I'm sure just another uh, objection that you've heard over and over again. And I want to uh, encourage the audience as well. Uh, because time really flies by here with you, Dr. Grady. Please check uh, your website as well, Creation Worldview, because tons yeah, of great Creation articles. CreationWorldview.org. We've got free articles. We have free short videos. We have a bookstore, of course, uh, with all kinds of things available. But but we have over 100 free articles. We have uh, today 285 free short videos. Awesome. Uh, on your YouTube channel, in your playlist section, you've got a ton of great kind of just short clips answering a lot of these questions, common objections. Right. And and I also point out if you've got insomnia, it's a great place to go. <laughs> um, so I guess I guess this question, I'd be curious as to your response is we've got all the uh, arc kinds coming off the arc you know, roughly 4,500 years ago, the critics will say, okay, there's way too many species today to have ever uh, came from, you know, a handful of art kinds 4,500 years ago. Um, what are your thoughts on that obje uh, objection, Dr. Grady? Well, this is simply diversity within a kind, than what we're saying. So all bears are bears. You know, all humans are humans. Now there's approximately seven point say four billion people alive on earth today they are all human they can all intermarry they can all produce children they can all have transplanted organs uh, whether it's from japan going to brazil uh, because we're all human and yet we are each one unique individually but we're all humans same thing with bears uh, there's a big problem i mean you're in canada there's a big problem, particularly in Western Canada right now in Northern Alaska with polar bears, which are overpopulating. They're not an endangered species. They're overpopulating and their territory is expanding into the other grizzlies and it's causing fights between bears, which often leads to death. But it's also leading to natural hybridization where we have half polar bear, half grizzly bear, cubs. Because bears are bears. It's like I say about dogs, you know, first of all, uh, there are many different kinds of dogs, as we say it. You know, there's many types of predated, you know, these pedigree animals. Um, but two Heinz 57 dogs came off the ark. And we now know, we now know, wolves, dogs, coyotes, and foxes are all dogs. Foxes are dogs. They're not a separate kind. And we have done breeding experiments where we have hybridization over overlapping and as long as you do it in slow gradual size increments and i think cats are the greatest illustration of this um, you can take a house cat and start breeding it with larger and larger cats and it will cross all the way up to lions and tigers and back again and even lions and tigers will cross breed and you get a liger or a tegon uh, a liger being the largest cat in the world um, the last I knew, the record holder was named Hercules, and this was a cat that weighed over 900 pounds. But genetically, you can go all the way from house cats to lynxes to surveils and jaguars and work your way up to lions and tigers and back again. Uh, the same thing with cows. You can take an American buffalo and breed it with a cow, and you get a buffalo, uh, beefalo, excuse me. You can cross it with a European bison, and you can even cross it with a yak, because they're all bovine creatures. Right. 
So one pair of cow-like creatures produces all the cow-like creatures we have. One pair of cat creatures will allow you to go up and down in size and get differentiation. But again, serviles and, and tigers and lions and so forth are simply ethnicities of cats. And, and here's an illustration. Now, let's say you have a purebred poodle. Now, remember that nature would never produce a poodle anyway. <laughs> uh, that's a man-made contraption right there. But uh, let's say you have a female poodle in the backyard, and she gets out accidentally. And um, she's uh, ready to reproduce. Uh, and she goes down the street. Now, is she looking for another poodle, or is she looking for another dog? Well, she doesn't know she's a poodle, and she's just looking for another dog. And so this, these arguments are fallacious, right. because all of these experiments will be done. All horses, including zebras. Zebras are simply horses with stripes. Uh, in Africa, we cross horses and zebras getting half-breed all the time, because these are the pack animals that you go up Mount Kilimanjaro with because they're as smart as a horse and tough as a zebra. And if you take a zebra and mate it with a horse for four generations, the stripes will disappear. I have pictures of herds of zebroids, which are horses with a variety of either stronger or lighter stripes. Um, you you ought to look up a, a picture on the internet, uh, you know, some image site for a, a creature called Eclipse. Um, there was a, a male horse and a female zebra uh, that were being transported together to a zoo in Germany. And people didn't think they'd mess around, but they did. And they produced a, a colt. And you should see it because the zebra parts are white and the horse parts are striped. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes you... Um, well, from our starting position, right, we, as you've pointed out, um, we would start from pre-existing information in the original created kinds. And therefore, these variations, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, they'd already be built in. As compared to the evolutionists, they got to build, they got to build up these variations in the first place. Well, again, they justify things by more and more storytelling. Well, you can only tell lies so long until the whole thing collapses. That's why they no longer believe in the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Now, Big Bang is being taught in the schools because that's what the teachers that are teaching right now were taught when they were students. But major evolutionists have abandoned the Big Bang and left it in droves because they had put so many Band-Aids on it that they finally had to admit it just doesn't work. And so what did they do? They simply went back to where they started, which was it's just eternal. Amen. Amen. Well said. Um, Dr. Grady, as, as I guess, as we start winding things down, it, it really does, time does fly by with you. And, and we're already going on the two hour mark. I, I can't believe it. There's so much great information here. I want people to share this around. We've still got over 60 people in the chat. Um, questions still flying in. So as we kind of wind it down here, I want to respect your time, Dr. Grady. This question came in from Doki Doki SFT fan club. This is a good question. And the question is, wh what should we say to old earth creation and theistic evolutionists that say young earth creation does more harm to the faith than, than good? And I would say that old earthers do more harm to the faith. And we started the program off with that, because if you believe in an old earth, whether you intend to do it, whether you're doing it intentionally or not, I'm not accusing you here. But if you believe in an old earth, old universe, you are denying the power of the cross. You're saying that death occurred before human sin. If that is true, if death occurs before the first sin of Adam, then his sin, which according to Paul in Romans 5.12, is the causative agent of death coming into the universe, you're denying that. And therefore, if Adam's sin is not what caused death to come into the universe, then Jesus' death cannot take it away. Amen. Amen. Well said. And, and another similar question that came in a while ago from Matt Powell, official, came in the form of a soup chat. I appreciate the uh, support, Matt. 
Um, he, he says, uh, Dr. Grady, what's the best approach to take when talking to those who believe in theistic evolution? How can we convince them of biblical creationism? Well, of course, I, I do think it determines whether this person is going to be reached through three theological answers or scientific answers. But I discussed this earlier in the program. Maybe you could review that. The six reasons why the old earth view cannot be acceptable in Christian theology. Again, it says that God's not omniscient, not omnipotent, that God is a liar, that God does not always have a witness, that God cannot always save a remnant, and again, that the death of nefesh organisms, such as human beings, occurred prior to human sin. Amen. Now, we need to lovingly correct them, not accost them, but lovingly them, correct them, because it means they've not been you know, subjected to the informations that I've been sharing with you. Now, I'm, I'm a full-time missionary. I'm just an ammunition bearer. You know, I bring you the ammunition, but you've got to be the ones that use it. And so in your witness, we need to lovingly correct those that are living in error. And we need to show them why theologically no old earth view. Now, I deny the existence uh, of old earth creationists because that's a misnomer. They are theistic evolutionists regardless of what they want to call themselves. But, but, regardless, uh, any old earth view denies the power of the cross for six very good reasons we cannot accept it theologically. And then, of course, scientifically, as I mentioned, there's all the things that disprove evolution, starting with the geochronometers, which I think is the big one, but then everything else in the evidence proves that it's not true. Amen. Amen. Um, I guess as, as we wind down here, we're so close to the two-hour mark. This question came in a few times. I wonder if you'd be interested in, in giving a response to it. Um, this comes in from, I put it up on the screen, uh, C Pam A C J D. So yeah, uh, well. yeah. <laughs> Did the Chick Exulub extinction event occur or not? Uh, you know, what is is your overall opinion on on that? Uh, well, to Dr. call it to call it the extinction event is to take an evolutionary view. Mm. Uh, evolutionists will claim that this impact uh, of what appears to be a small asteroid or very large meteor occurring near the Yucatan Peninsula tip. Um, cause then the dinosaurs to become extinct. I mean, that's the general story. Right. Well, first of all, it's not true. Um, supposedly, this event caused the KT layer, and the fact of the matter is we found fossil dinosaurs above the, key to, uh, the KT layer. So it's simply not true. Now, did the event occur? Absolutely. When did it occur? Uh, probably the second half of the flood. Uh, the reason I say that is there's no question that it's an impact. Uh, we see the circular rings of the impact and, and all the things that are typical of an impact. But if it had occurred in the first half of the flood, uh, the evidence probably would have been wiped away. And so this is probably something that occurred maybe halfway through the second half, you know, about three quarters of the way through the flood, when the evidence would be left and not completely obliterated. Um, so I, that's approximately when I would, would put it. But it has to be while the flood is still active because, um, you know, if the flood had not occurred yet, it would have been completely wiped away. So I think that that's kind of how we can reason through that. But it did not cause extinction of the dinosaurs. It didn't cause extinction of most of the life on Earth. That's simply, again, an evolutionary fairy tale that they're telling about this because... If the impact then does occur in the second half of the flood, which is where I place it, um, you'd still have water covering this area. It, it wouldn't have caused all this dust and so forth to be thrown into the air because it would have been an underwater event. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's reason to argue against it. So to call it an extinction event is simply to adopt an evolutionary view of it without taking a look at the real science and a biblical worldview. Amen. 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 I'd, I'd, be I'd be curious as to, as your, to your thoughts, thoughts uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Grady, Grady. on, I've, I've noticed that the critics of a uh, worldwide flood, they will pretty well ignore all the overwhelming evidence uh, for a worldwide flood, and they will look to this criticism. They'll say that the global flood uh, would have produced way too much heat 
which means that the, the flood could not have happened because the resulting heat would have melted the crust. The radiation would have, uh, you know, been detrimental to Noah and, and the ark animals. And I, I find this is their way to just remain willingly ignorant to the scientific evidence for the flood and just say, well, there's too much heat. So there couldn't have been a flood. What would, uh, I'd be curious as to your thoughts on that criticism. Well, again, it's not true. Uh, now, at the time of the flood, millions of cubic miles of water, uh, somewhere in the areas of 450 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, did come up from below. Uh, the actual Bible terminology in, uh, in, my, in my DVD on the flood called The Water's Cleave, that's where the terminology comes from, is the Hebrew. Uh, it says the water's knife through from below, cleave. That's what the word cleave means, is to come to a knife edge. Um, that the water's cleave from below erupting from below, knifing through the Earth's crust, and all this hot water came up. But the fact of the matter is that if you'll take a look at the maps we show, um, the water was coming up on land only from Caesarea Philippi down to Elot, down what is now the Red Sea, to the Gulf of Aden. That's the only time that the hot water is coming out above ground. It's not a very long distance. Once it reaches the Gulf of Aden, uh, then we have all of this activity occurring underwater. So first of all, there's going to be a lot of moderation and mixing of the water to take away a lot of that heat. But the second thing is, at 900 degrees, you have what's called super hot or super critical steam. It's liquid steam. Uh, and when it, when it expands, when it's released, and, and, and think, uh, as I use in my illustration of what I'm teaching, Think of a pressure cooker that doesn't hold on. Now, the pressure cooker that doesn't hold on, for those that have seen it, the water inside is liquid above 212 because of the pressure of the lid. And typically in a pressure cooker, when it explodes uh, on a stove, it's around 260, maybe 280. Um, Mount St. Helens, the water erupted inside Mount Helens, St. Helens North Face at about 450. Um, but the water coming up from below the flood is millions of cubic miles at temperatures around 900. But when that explodes, it explodes. And what you get is expansion cooling. They're just like any explosion, uh, stick of TNT. The, the area closest to the stick of TNT has tremendous force and power. But then that force and power is dissipated uh, as it leaves, the same way that sound uh, decays in decibels, for instance. Uh, and it's exponential. And so what's going to happen is the rapid expansion of this liquid steam at 900 is actually going to cool very quickly, as well as being moderated by the water that it's actually coming un, you know, out underneath and mixing with. And this is one reason why we find millions and millions of dead fish buried in, in layers around the earth, in mud layers, fossilized, is because anywhere near where the mid-oceanic ridge, which is 40-some thousand miles long, um, anything close to it would have died from heat. But there's lots of places where the temperature stayed low enough for life to continue in the oceans. Now think about it where you are. In the wintertime in Canada, um, you go into the bathroom, you turn the hot water on in the tub. Now, what happens? Well, the hot water is coming out of the spigot at one end of the tub, and the water is starting to fill the tub. But if you feel the water at the far end, it's still cool. And if you really want to get a bath quickly, what you do is you have to stir it to get the uniform heating of the water that's in the tub. Is that correct? Right. Well, the same thing is true, say, for instance, in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, the, the great tectonic plate points where the mid-oceanic ridge is actually allowing this hot water to come through, uh, there are places that are well away from it and where the water would not have mixed to the point of killing life. And so this is why some whales and some fish and so forth survived. You don't need a lot of them because they reproduce very quickly. Well, that's a great answer because that is um, a very common criticism. And I, I really love how detailed you are in your responses. In, in, in a two hour interview today, we've really touched on a, a lot of the, you know, the favorite objections put forth by the critics. We've touched on so much 
fascinating evidence for young earth creation, a global flood, um, special creation in general, evidence against evolution. Uh, Grady, so I'm, I'm going to make this the last question since we are going on over uh, two hours. This did come in the form of a super chat, so I want to at least get it out there. It's from Shipwright. $5 super chat. I appreciate the support. God bless you. Um, he asks, can you ask the good doctor what he thinks about the axes of evil? And then he... I would have to ask Shipwright to define that because it's been used as a term in different ways and so forth. Uh, but Satan is always Satan. Uh, his name is Hasatan. His name actually means in English, the adversary. And so we are fighting Satan always from the Garden of Eden to the time he's thrown into the lake of fire. And we're fighting his minions and his methodologies and those that are on his side, shall we say. So when you define the axis of evil, there's different ways of, of using the term, and I don't know which one he's meaning. But the fact of the matter is we're having to fight evil daily. You know, if Adam and Eve were, were not immune from the wiles of Satan, neither are you. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well said. Well, as we kind of wrap up here, uh, Dr. Grady, again, I want to encourage people to check out your your website. I want people to uh, check out your YouTube channel. Uh, you've been a blessing to this ministry. And uh, I wanted to thank you again for giving us over two hours of, of your time. The first interview, same thing. We went for about two and a half hours. So you're very generous with your time. Any, any last words, final thoughts, Dr. Uh, McMurtry? Well, I would simply challenge any Christian to, to believe in biblical inerrancy, not literal reading, but biblical inerrancy, understanding that God does use metaphor, analogy, simile, proverb, etc., cetera, um, and understand that he's a perfect author and that you do not have the mental ability to pick and choose what you want to in the Bible. You have to accept the whole thing because if you accept only part of it, then you've made a compromise. And once you make one compromise, it leads us to two and then to four and then to six. And eventually you lose your faith altogether. Amen. And and you're uh, an incredible blessing helping uh, not only new Christians who have, I know when I got saved roughly, roughly six or seven years ago, Dr. Grady, these were a lot of questions that were on my mind. And having, uh, you know, great people like yourself provide answers really helped as, as a babe in Christ. And so, you know, there, there's always answers to these types of questions. And, and that's why I encourage people to check out uh, your website, your YouTube channel, where you answer a lot of these questions. Well, that's just it. We're a resource to, to the Christian body. Uh, again, we're apologetic, but we're apologetic both in Christian theology and in good science and showing that we don't need science to support the Bible, but good science does support the Bible. And you really can trust it from Genesis chapter one to the end of Revelation. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well, thank you again. Uh, we've got a lot of people in the live chat saying thank you, Dr. McMurtry. Uh, and, and they all really appreciate your your help in, in answering these questions. Hopefully we can have you on again uh, in the future as <laughs> two hours really does fly by. Uh, it does, does. Dr. McMurtry. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, uh, God bless uh, Dr. Grady. God bless to everybody in the chat. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow as well. So please uh, check the reminder section for upcoming live streams and uh, share this content around. It's, it's incredibly important. This information needs to get out there. Thanks again, Dr. Grady. God no, bless. Sure. SFT's out. And bless.